Hey church, welcome back to another episode of Basic Beliefs. Today we're going to answer the question, who is the Holy Spirit? Before we dig in, let's go to God in a word of prayer. Father God, you are so good and we are so grateful for your word and your truth. And Lord, as we learn about the Holy Spirit today, I pray that you would fill us up. Lord, that you would help us to become more like you. That you would instill your word and your truth in our hearts and in our minds that we might apply it in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. So let's jump right in to our statement of faith. We believe in the Holy Spirit, not as an impersonal principle or influence, but as a divine person. And though distinct from the Father and Son, proceeding from both, with whom he is equal in authority, power, glory, and titles. He is the divine agent in conviction of sin, regeneration, sanctification, and the believer's assurance. He is given as an indwelling presence to every believer to be a teacher, guide, and source of comfort. He purifies the heart of the believer and imparts at his own choosing spiritual gifts for service and the building up of the body of Christ. He produces in believers the fruit of the Spirit so that they may conform to the image of Christ. So that was our full statement of faith, our truth, the doctrine that we believe in here in our church. And let's kind of take a look, phrase by phrase, right, word by word, and look into God's word at at some scripture passages that deal specifically with these truths. And so the first thing we want to answer about the Holy Spirit is the fact that He is not impersonal. He, the Spirit, is not just a force or an influence over us, right? He is very personal. And the meaning behind personal there is a sense of relationship. He is not just kind of a force, but has this relationship with us. So let's take a look at John chapter 14, and specifically verses 16 and 17. But honestly, I would encourage you, um, if you're looking into the Holy Spirit, um, if you're looking at him being sent down uh, after Jesus' resurrection, if you're looking into Pentecost, uh, to look at Jesus' own words. Take a look at John chapter 14 to 17. And, and throughout this passage, Jesus is talking about him going into a heaven, right, after his death and talking about his resurrection, talking about his ascension into heaven and talking about sending the Holy Spirit. And so John 14 to 17 is just a really great passage to look at how Jesus talks about the Spirit, how Jesus talks about the Father and how Jesus talks about like our own purpose after he goes to the cross and rises from the grave and ascends into heaven. What is it that we're supposed to do? So so take a look at those passages. Maybe read those on your own. John chapter 14 through 17. But that's going to be a passage that we take a look at. We're going to jump at a few different spots as we talk about some of these things about the Holy Spirit because those are the spots where Jesus specifically talks about the Spirit. Now verses 16 and 17 of John chapter 14, Jesus says this, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. And so the emphasis and reason behind taking a look at those particular verses is the fact that Jesus says he knows you. You will know him. And this kind of terminology to be known, I mean, is used throughout Scripture, right? When when it talks about Jesus knowing the hearts of the Pharisees, that same word is used. And it's like this idea that Jesus knows our thoughts, our desires, our hearts. He truly knows who we are. And this is the same sense of saying that you know the Spirit. You know his character, you know what he is like, you know you can feel that he is with you. And so the Spirit is not just like impersonal, like we can somehow use his power uh, on our own or just manipulate him or use this godly force because it's not a force. The Spirit, he is a 
person, and he is personal with us. And the fact that we can know him and what he's like and when he is with us. We know the spirit. The spirit is not an it, but a he that we can have a relationship with. That we can know just like we know another person. And so that is exactly what Jesus says here in that passage in John 14. Additionally, in verse 26, Jesus says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. And so another thing with the Spirit is that he teaches, right? He shows, he brings to remembrance, he acts, right? He communicates. And so it's not just impersonal, but the Spirit is very personal. He works He speaks, he talks, he guides, all of these things he does to us, with us, in relationship. Um, Not as impersonal, but as very personal. And so he himself is a person. I also want to jump to John chapter 16 uh, in verse 13 and 14. John 16, verse 13 and 14, and this is kind of in that same section where Jesus is talking to his disciples. So in that passage, Jesus says, When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. And so the same thing in this passage, the Spirit is guiding, speaking, teaching, hearing from the Father and passing it on. And so all these things have to do with the personhood of the Holy Spirit and not just the fact that he is a person, but also that he is personal with us, that we can know him and have a relationship with him. Our doctrine goes on and our statement of faith says, He is distinct, the Spirit is distinct from the Father and the Son, but proceeds from both, proceeding from both. Now, sometimes we get caught up in that word proceeding, and and here in this very same passage in John, John 15 and verse 26 says this, But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father... The Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. He will bear witness about me. Now, sometimes we get caught up on that word proceeds. Like in some way, the Spirit is underneath the Father and the Son. That the Spirit is a force of the Father and Son. But he isn't, right? The Spirit proceeding from the Father and Son, really just means to go forth. And so let me read that passage for you again. John chapter 15 and verse 26. But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. Now let me change that word proceeds, because like I said, the meaning of that proceeding really means just to go forth or be sent. So let me... Use that term go forth instead of proceeds. But when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who goes forth from the Father, he will bear witness about me. That sense of proceeding really means to just be sent by. To be sent by. And when we look in this, you know, in John 16, 7, it also says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And so Jesus talks about that sending, that he is sending forth, that the Spirit is going forth from the Son, that the Spirit is going forth from the Father. But this type of of discussion, this type of of phraseology that Jesus is using uh, about the Spirit, he also uses about himself. So if we look in the same section of scripture, John 15 and and verse 21, but all these things they will do to you on account of my name. Jesus is saying that essentially the disciples are going to be persecuted. And he says, because they do not know him who sent 
me. So Jesus there says, God the Father sent me. And so even in verse uh, or chapter 16, verse 5 of John, Jesus also says, but now I'm going to him who sent me. So Jesus, as he's talking about the Spirit and being the Spirit being sent forth by him and by the Father, he says the same thing about himself. That the Father sent forth the Son. And so this idea of being sent doesn't necessarily mean that the Spirit is less than or less powerful or is merely a force because the same thing is said about Jesus. And in fact, Jesus says the same thing about himself. But we know that the Spirit is sent forth by both the Father and the Son and they essentially work together. They work together for their purposes on earth. So let's continue to read our statement of faith here, so that uh, even though he is distinct from the Father and the Son, proceeding from both, with whom he is equal in authority, power, glory, and titles. Now I'm not going to dig into this a ton, because once again, next week, our episode is going to be on the Trinity. What is the Trinity? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. How does that work together? One God three persons. That will be next week. So I'm not going to dig into this as much. But Matthew 28, 19, which is the Great Commission, says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And in that passage, which is one of several that talks about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, kind of on equal um, ground. They have equal stances. They are, they are equal in title and equal in importance. And that is just kind of one passage that puts them on like this level playing ground. And that's kind of where, what we're looking about. The equality of the three persons in one God in the sense that they are all God, all fully God, but one distinct God in three persons. Going forward with our doctrine, the Spirit is the divine agent in conviction of sin. In conviction of sin. John 16, 8. Yeah, we're still in the same section. And that's why I said, you ought to just go and read John 14 to 17. It's a great passage of scripture. Jesus talking to his disciples and praying uh, prior to his crucifixion. But John 16, it says, And when he comes, this Holy Spirit, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. And so when the Holy Spirit comes, he convicts our hearts as to what is right and wrong, not in our eyes, but in God's eyes. And so in that sense, the Holy Spirit, he, he is the one who reveals truth to us, specifically truth about what is right and wrong, in God's eyes, God, the creator of the universe, who is the one who defines right and wrong, our eyes can be opened to that because he comes and convicts us. The Holy Spirit is also the divine agent in regeneration. Now, regeneration is really kind of a fancy theological word. Um, and what we mean, what the word regeneration means is really to create new, to make something new, to re generate, make something new. And that's a common term used. The simple biblical term would be to be born again. And so the passage on being born again comes from John chapter 3, while Jesus is talking with the Pharisee Nicodemus. And in that passage, John chapter 3, uh, particularly verses uh, 5 through verse 7, uh, Jesus says this, Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. And so that term, regeneration, that the Holy Spirit brings regeneration. So in that passage, we see that Jesus says you must be born of the Spirit. You must be born of the Spirit, so made new in the Spirit. He comes and changes us into something different. Rather than being born of the flesh, we are born of the Spirit. And actually that term being born again, um, I don't love the word again. So 
that is true that we are born again, or you could say born a second time, that we are made new in a slightly different way, in a spiritual way. But that the Greek word there used, which uh, the New Testament was originally written in Greek, this, this passage John originally wrote in Greek, where it says born again, that word again is usually translated as above or heavenly. And so if we were to, to maybe more accurately translate that, rather than just say to be born again or be born a second time or be born in a different way, it would be better translated as being born from above. So Jesus says, you must be born of the Spirit. And then he says, don't marvel that I said you must be born from above or born of heavenly things, because that's exactly what he means. So when the Spirit, when he dwells in us and has a relationship with us and when we receive him, we are changed. We are made something different to where we're not totally flesh. And what it means to be born of the flesh is born with fleshly desires. We hunger, we want things, we desire, we take pleasure in certain ways and with certain things. But the Holy Spirit changes that to where we take pleasure and we desire after things that are different, particularly to love God and to love other people. And so the fleshly desires are merely for ourselves, but spiritual desires are for others in love and in kindness and in peace and so many other things. But, but Jesus says to be, to, for regeneration to happen, the spirit is the one who causes us to be changed and be born from above rather than of the flesh and the body. And so the Holy Spirit is the divine agent for conviction of sin, for regeneration, and also for sanctification. Um, now sanctification is kind of one of my favorite, um, theological words or phrases. To be sanctified means to be made holy. And the word holy means to be consecrated or set apart. Now, I talked a little bit about that when I talked about God, that God is holy, set apart, different from the rest of creation and and humans. And uh, it's just different, set apart for a different purpose. And so we... When we are called to be sanctified, we are also called to be holy, to be different. 1 Corinthians 6.11 says, and I'm flipping flipping the pages in my Bible to get there here. 1 Corinthians 6.11 says, uh, And such were some of you, talking about sinners, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God, by the Spirit of you were sanctified. And so we look at that term sanctified to be made holy. The way that I like to look at the term holiness. So to be holy means to be set apart. And when you think about being set apart in our lives, are things set apart and different because they are fulfilling the purposes of God? So when you have conversations with other people, Is there a certain focus? Is there a difference because you have a relationship with Christ, because you are God's child, because you have the Holy Spirit? Do you talk to others differently because of that? Do you treat them differently? Is your attitude different? And so if we're just kind of living our earthly lives in the body, we will have certain attitudes that are based on our surroundings and our emotion and all kinds of other things. But we can set apart our emotions for God because of the Holy Spirit, and there's a difference. And so to be fully sanctified, to be completely holy, the way that I look at that is, is in every moment of your life, is God's presence there? Is your attitude based on God's presence? Is your action based on God's presence? Are the words you say based on God's presence? Is every moment of your day holy or set apart for God. And that's something that's really hard to do, but it's something that the Holy Spirit helps us in. And a great way you can test this in yourself is with your driving. Is your driving time set apart for God? Is it consecrated and holy? When somebody cuts you off, do you act differently because the Holy Spirit is with you? Right? Do you have patience when you're on the road, when nobody else can see, 
Is your life set apart for God? And that's a huge test because usually while we're driving, we're all alone, right? There are things that are impacting us from our surroundings, but our actions and who sees it, it's a lot of times just between us and God. Are our lives holy and are, is it sanctified? Is it set apart for God or do we just act on our own flesh and on our behalf? And so the Holy Spirit is the one who helps to sanctify us or set apart our lives for God. The Holy Spirit is also the divine agent in our assurance. Romans 8 and particularly um, verse 16 says this, the Spirit himself bears, bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So the Spirit bears witness that we are the children of God. And that's really where our assurance comes from. So that term assurance means that we know, right? We know for fact and for truth that we are God's children, right? That God has forgiven us, that God has redeemed us or bought us back, that we are part of his family. Ultimately, that means that in the final judgment, right, we will spend our eternity with him. And so our assurance comes from the Spirit, so he bears witness in our hearts and in our lives. If he is with us, we know that we are with God, that God has forgiven us, that God has saved us, that God is a place for us in eternity. It is the spirit with us that gives us that final affirmation and that we can know that we are God's children. So let's move on to that next paragraph of our statement of faith. It says, the spirit he is given as an indwelling presence to every believer to be a teacher, guide, and source of comfort. So he is our teacher. John 14, yeah, we're jumping back to that passage. John 14 and 26, uh, which we've already kind of looked at. In that passage, Jesus says, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things, and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So all that Jesus has spoken, all that Jesus has taught. So the Holy Spirit comes and teaches us the things that Jesus and the things that God the Father wants us to know as his children and as his followers. And additionally, he causes us to remember all of the things that Jesus has taught. So the Spirit actively teaches and helps us to remember the things that Jesus and the Father has taught. He is also our guide, John 16, 13, which once again is in the same passage as Jesus teaching his disciples. It says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will declare to you the things that are to come. And so the spirit guides us in truth. He helps us to discern the will of the Father. He helps us to understand and act upon God's truth. So we're no longer living by our own instincts, our own feelings, our own emotions, but the Holy Spirit helps to guide us into action what is happening based on what is happening around us and based on his truth, how we live in those circumstances that we face. And also the Spirit is a spirit of comfort. Uh, simply in, in Acts chapter 9 and verse 31, we're told that we can be in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. So in that sense, the Holy Spirit, uh, he, uh, his presence with us gives us comfort, not just that we know that we are God's children, but honestly, it gives us kind of strength and courage, knowing that whatever we face in this world, whatever hardship there is, whatever burden that we carry, ultimately the Spirit's presence with us, it says that God is with us. Like, think about that just for a second. When I just say God is with you, the almighty, all-powerful, all-knowing creator of the universe, the God, he's with you, in you, beside you, watching you, teaching you, showing you the truth, helping to guide you, providing you comfort and joy and love. God is with you. And so that just kind of makes the problems of the world fade a little bit. And, and just to say, man, 
There is something so much bigger. And he is here. The God of the universe chose to be with me. And to love me. If that doesn't give you comfort, I don't know what will. And to know the fact that he has a plan. He has a plan and a purpose for you and your life and your eternity. That's comforting. The Holy Spirit purifies the heart of the believer. Uh, I want to read this Acts chapter 15 and verse 9. Acts chapter 15 and verse 9. Which says this. And he made no distinction between us and them. This is talking about Gentiles and Jews as they both receive the Holy Spirit as he comes to both groups after Pentecost. He made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now that term cleanse literally means to wash away, to purify your heart, to take away sinful desires, evil wickedness. And so in this passage, um, the scripture is specifically talking about people who did not have a relationship with God, people who were not religiously right Jewish or no who God was, or even who Jesus was. These people found out about Jesus and his death for our sins and his resurrection. They received the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came down to be with them and to dwell in them. And their hearts were cleansed the same as those who had known Jesus before, and even those who were Jewish before and who knew God. The Holy Spirit came the same and purified their hearts so that they would desire after what is good and righteous and not what was evil and wicked. And that's an amazing thing, right? That the Holy Spirit can literally come in and change everything, which we already talked about regeneration being born again. That's what it means to change the heart to love what is evil and change it into to love what is good and righteous. So the hearts were cleansed. The Holy Spirit also imparts at his own choosing spiritual gifts for service and the building up of the body of Christ. There's a couple of passages that I'm going to read here. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verses 4 to 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verses 4 to 11. And this is what the Apostle Paul writes there. Now, there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are a variety of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. And so the main takeaway from that passage is that the Holy Spirit comes, he gifts, he gifts, he chooses these spiritual gifts that he's going to give to each and every believer. For some it's faith, for some it's the ability to discern whether somebody is in the Spirit or not, or is living by the truth, or is telling the truth or not, or what is truth, or what is good in God's eyes. Uh, He talks about miracles. He talks about teaching, that not everybody is going to share these same gifts, but the Spirit chooses how He gives. But ultimately, all of these things are the same Spirit and the same Spirit in all. So that is important because all of these things work together in unity for the good of the whole. Now that emphasis is carried forward and maybe even uh, better stated in Ephesians chapter 4, and I'm going to read verses 11 to 16. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11 to 16. And he gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood 
to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint, with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. And so in the same passage, it talks about the Holy Spirit giving uh, apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers. Those are all gifts, right? All of these gifts, but those gifts are to equip the saints or the church, the body of Christ, every believer for the work of ministry. So a teacher helps to teach others how to teach. An evangelist who has natural spiritual gifts of evangelism and can reach people for Christ helps the other members in the body of Christ to evangelize, to share the gospel message so that the whole church can work together in the purpose of God and to do the good work of God in this world together. And we all build each other up to maturity And specifically, it talks there that we're not carried away to and fro by winds of doctrine, right? That when we see something on the news, that when we hear something from somebody who is blaspheming and and speaking heresy, we don't get sucked into those things. That when the whole church looks to those who have those specific giftings and learns from them and applies them in their own life, that the whole body is built up in unity. Remember, one spirit all together for the same purpose. And ultimately, um, the Holy Spirit produces in believers the fruit of the Spirit so that they may conform to the image of Christ. Now, the most common passage talking about the fruit of the Spirit is in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22 and 23. And in that passage, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. And so ultimately, the Holy Spirit uh, not only convicts us of sin and changes us and purifies our hearts and helps, gives us a gift so that we might grow and be equipped in truth and in love and in service to build up the whole body, all working together in unison, but also that we ourselves are conformed into the image of Christ. We become more loving. We become more joyful. We become more Uh, at peace. We have patience. We have kindness. We have goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Now, the opposite of those things should be going away, right? The opposite of those things should be going away. So hate in our lives goes away and love abounds, right? Uh, Other things like uh, quick-tempered and lashing out decreases and goes away and patience reigns in our lives because the Spirit molds us into the image of Jesus. And so that is who the Spirit is. He is a a member of the Godhead of the Trinity, fully God, but his own person. And he works in these ways in our lives. Now, if you have questions on the Holy Spirit, please message us here on Facebook. Feel free to send me uh, an email at the church, or you can always call the office to talk to myself or one of the other pastors here, and we would love to speak to you. But please, uh, hey, take a look at that John chapter 14 to 17 or any of the other passages that I've mentioned today. Uh, We'd love to talk about you. And I want to invite you to come back next week. We're going to be talking about the Trinity. I'm going to try to explain that to you to the best of my ability. Thanks. Love y'all. See you next week.